So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming here to NOMA today. Uh, my name is Russell Lord. I'm the curator of photographs here at the museum. And we're very excited to have the artist Monique Verdan with us today to share some thoughts uh, about this exhibition and, and I hope about her own work. Um, uh, this show was organized by our Mellon Fellow for Photographs, Brian Piper, who couldn't be with us today. Um, but he did a wonderful job pulling together a group of works almost exclusively from Noma's permanent collection uh, of photographs. So there's one work that we borrowed from the Historic New Orleans collection, which we're very grateful for, uh, but everything else is, is part of our, our very vast collection of photography here. Uh, and we're excited to have uh, Monique's perspective today. Monique is uh, a very well-known and established artist in this community whose work uh, kind of crosses media boundaries from photography to film. Uh, she's been presented in many uh, exhibitions in this uh, city, uh, including Prospect. I know we have some Prospect people in the audience today. Um, and her work centers around the intersections of economics, climate, uh, culture, um, uh, environmental impact, especially as they pertain to the Louisiana coast and the Homa Nation. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy. Thank you all for, um, for coming and thank you to the museum and of course to Brian for the invitation to be part of, um, of this conversation about all of these images. Um, yeah, bring up so many I different ideas. It's hard to kind of focus in um, on place. And I think that the title of you are here, you know, that here means a lot of different things for a lot of different people, given many different perspectives. Um, and just want to acknowledge where we are right now, um, on the banks of the Bayou Shupik, that you may know as Bayou St. John, and that this has been a place where many different kinds of people have been passing through and coming together and sharing ideas and perspectives for a very long time. Um, last year, uh, the city of New Orleans celebrated its colonial founding, and I like to make sure we're putting like a big underline the, under the colonial piece. Um, and I am from the Homa Nation, my father's people are from the Yahweh um, which is between the Atchafalaya and Mississippi rivers. Um, and, you know, the Homa have a very um, complicated story, as all of our stories are. Um, but, you know, this place where we are now, um, which the colonizers renamed, very um, successfully rebranded a place, Nouvelle Orléans, but was called Bolancha um, prior to colonization, and that meaning place where many tongues are spoken or many languages are spoken because this was a place where the Homa, the Biloxi, the Shiramacha, the Shakta, the Atakafa, the Akola Kisa, the Washa, Shawasha, the Shapatulas, and the Bayi Bula, and many names of the nations that I'm not mentioning right now because I'm just forgetting them, <laughs> um, but also because they have been forgotten and erased from our history. And so also to just, um, I've been spending a lot of time working on a project called Return to the Yapni Shido, which, which is um, going to be produced um, and printed by the Neighborhood Story Project through the University of New Orleans, and it'll be coming out soon. Um, kind of a collection of my images and in conversation with my community um, in the Yapni Shido. And um, been thinking about time and history and place a lot. Um, and on this day where we are celebrating Juneteenth, I think it's really important for us to remember that our quest for um, liberation is not complete and we are needing to pay attention to the history, to our history in order for us to move forward in healthy and sustainable ways that um, equality and justice and liberation is for all, um, not only the people, <laughs> but also for the land and and for those who, who are not of, of human nature. Um, so with all of that being said, um, my work has been focused on my family and focused on the Yapni Shido, focused on um, this PowerPoint 
that we call the Mississippi River Delta. Um, and I've been looking through a very personal lens at my, my family and our challenges at kind of the ends of the bayous here in, in the Delta. Um, but also recognizing that that's a very particular um, lens that I allow others to, to view and to come into my world in, a, in a, almost a curated way. Um, and I think that all of the images that we look at today offer a very like unique perspective and to think about what's not seen and to think about the privilege of, of, of being able to frame the world that, that we're witnessing. And I do think of imagery so much from my own work um, comes out of documentary um, practice and you know imagery as evidence um, and I think that you know you can manipulate that in different ways with photography and as we move through the space and I think that also you know the, the privilege of access to the tools and how the tools of photography have changed and how you can manipulate things in different ways as that technology changes right and as those tools that you have access to evolve um, and so I love that uh, these are the three images that, that kind of are, are the foundational pieces, I think, for, for this exhibition. And I love this cyanotype that's back here um, because it is that evidence. And um, when I walked through the space with Brian, you know, he was explaining that this is um, the only image that has actually had physical contact. Right. This is this was taken. This and I think it's also beautiful, right? Photography is all about the light, um, and that this was taken with the sun, and it's of the nature. But it was of the nature that was that was also gathered from thousands of miles away and brought back to England. And it's also a woman, um, Anna Atkins. So this image was taken. Uh, they're saying between 1852 and 1854, and it's of Ceylon tea leaves. Um, I have a, another project that is called the Land Memory Bank and Seed Exchange. And if any of you are ever curious to take a long ride down um, St. Claude, which essentially turns into St. Bernard Highway, which turns into Bayou Road and follows the old distributary of uh, the Mississippi known as Bayou Terrebuff, which is where I live. It's about 40 minutes from here. Um, we have a, a medicinal garden there. Um, and we are trying to preserve um, the plants that are disappearing that have been used for traditional medicine um, and for uh, preservation in this, in this part of the world for a long time. And so for me, this image really resonated because it's this document. Um, it's a document of the nature, but also I think reflects this uh, globalism and so much of this um, exhibition is all over the world which again is like being able to have these windows into different cultures and different places um, is such a privilege um, really and also um, has so much to say without having so many words which is right the beauty of, of photography in general um, i'm going to move us around to the other um, gallery because i wanted to just kind of um, ground us in, in this place of, of Guabuncha. And some of these images in here are great for that. Uh, um, so I was totally drawn to um, this image by Harold Bacquet. Um, which is the, the one image that is on loan by the Historic New Orleans collection. Um, and I think this image resonates with me um, in so many uh, ways. Um, you know, I, I know Harold's work when I first started taking photographs. Um, I actually was working with a photographer by the name of David Richmond, who has since passed. Um, but all of these photographers in like the 60s and 70s here in New Orleans, um, Harold and David Richmond and Barry Kaiser and Owen Murphy and Victoria Ryan and you know these these characters that are kind of the fabric of the photo world here um, were really uh, mentors of mine and, and people I, I just I have so much love and appreciation for what they've captured and what they've shared 
and, and Harold being of like that family, I think, um, you know, and knowing this place, right? Like I see this image and I, I that's like, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, that's New Orleans on any given day. It's just that moment, you know, and that you capture that moment with like all of these different stories that are intersecting. Um, and I think that, you know, it's really fascinating to, to see that and like to feel that in real time, like the life that's there. Um, and there's another other assortment of images here that are all from New Orleans around different times. Um, I'm a huge fan of Marion Post Wolcott's work, um, and she was working for the Farm Security Administration, um, and had come down and done a lot of uh, photographing in St. Bernard Parish, where uh, where I'm from, during a time when um, the you know it was kind of right after there was a big trappers' war. So she has this incredible documentation of the Isleños, which are Canary Island descendants who settled in these um, in these low lying lands, not too far from here. Um, but you know this image of New Orleans was taken in 1940, and then you have these other two images, which are about 10 years apart. So this one's from 19, oh, five years apart, so 1930 and 1925. And you know, these, I, these like romantic ideas about what a place is, um, and to think about the photographer's perspective and like why not only are, were these images taken, but you know, who, who was resourcing the work to be done. And so I think about that a lot as I look around, you know, it's like, well, why was this image taken? This is like, this is pure pleasure in the moment. Like, he wasn't commissioned to do that. Um, that's just something that happened. Whereas you look at some of the other images and you're like, hmm, you know, what kind of story were they trying to tell? Um, what were they trying to capture? Why was that? Um, but I think that these windows, you know, and this kind of romantic 1925 image, which makes you think like, oh, it could be in the 1800s, it has a fire hydrant, right? But then this image is five years different. And to know that those times, that, that, not that much time had changed, but also how quickly time changes the landscape. And so I want to like, in so many of these images, I want to see what those places look like now. I like wonder, this street corner, I think it looks pretty much the same, but like, you know, to see this street corner or to see even, you know, there's a panorama um, of Pompeii, which was taken a very long time ago. What if we were to see that image today covered in tourist? You know, like how those um, perspectives of place change. Um, when I, I, I was really, um, blessed with being a student of Leslie Parr, who um, was a professor about Loyola, I think she's recently retired, and is a documentary photographer here um, in New Orleans. And she introduced me to Jacob Rees, and so when I first walked into the space here, I was like, ah, really drawn to this image. And <coughs> so Jacob Rees, uh, for those who don't know, um, was working in New York City, <coughs> And he's kind of credited with being, um, you know, a, a father of photography of sorts because <clears throat> he was really one of the first photographers to use flash photography. But he was so, he was driven by by a social cause really, and that was um, these tenements that were all across uh, New York City or in uh, the five the five points five points I think is where he was mostly working, but uh, Lower East Side. And so uh, Jacob Reese was like going into these tenements using this crazy flash photography, which was also like highly flammable, and, and photographing what was happening um, there. And so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the work, it, it was moving. And he also had this whole other strategy of doing these magic lanterns. So there were these public um, engagements where he was doing these projections of the images that he was capturing. And I think that, you know, in the world of photography, and now, you know, <laughs> to think of, like, TV compared to a magic lantern, but, like, TV is kind of a magic lantern, um, but how, you know, the telling of these stories, and again, for what purpose? Um, and also, who's the audience, right? It's always like, who, 
who who's looking at and I wonder that about you know my own like critique for myself when I first started taking it, I didn't really care about the audience. <laughs> I was just like, I'm doing this, like, but as you move forward, right, and especially being someone who um, I mean, I think that I come out of this social practice that I don't really care about being in a gallery. I mean, not that it isn't like nice to be in a room where you can have things nicely framed. I mean, I love art, I love to be in that space, but also for me, that isn't what drives me. I'm not looking to like sell a print. Um, I'm looking, it's always been for me to raise people's awareness of what's happening for my own family. Um, and that has shifted and changed also too, and knowing that the audience is, um, the audiences are different, right? And also now I'm at a point where I'm like re-challenging myself because I think like it's great to talk to adults, but like how do you talk to children about places that are disappearing? And how do you frame a story for them to be able to digest it and not be freaked out by climate change as well, but to find some sort of hope in, in the imagery. So I take lots of pictures of dead trees and that's not working out so great. <laughs> <laughs> My Louisiana love, my grandmother's super cool, so, you know, um, she takes the, the star um, fame there, and hopefully it will be back out on public television um, soon. We just signed a, a new contract, so it'll be, um, you'll be able to stream it digitally. It's called My Louisiana Love, if you're curious. Um, so, yeah, I know, just, and again, this, like, window, right, even, um, so just to, sorry, right behind you, sir, there, to, to just to contrast these like perspectives and windows into, into worlds that we're not able to access, right? Like landscapes we can't see, but also how people are living. Um, and uh, in my adult life, I've kind of been put into this category of being uh, titled as like an artist and activist. Um, and I do do a lot of, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm like, why do, why do you have to be considered an activist if you're just trying to be rational? Which is like, I would like to have clean water in my life. Um, and um, be able to like have my family fish and not worry about tar balls coming into their nets. Um, but this photograph, which was taken by Eric Solomon um, in 1930 at The Hague, uh, is another just like really striking image. So um, this photographer was kind of a sneaky guy. He was known for like, getting into places where maybe he wasn't supposed to be and snapping images that weren't supposed to be snapped in some cases, like this one. Um, and there are these guys and they're just hanging out, you know, they've been at the Hague, they're talking about, I don't know, war crimes from World War One or what have you, but I think this image is like, it says so much about how there are these spaces where there are these like five guys who are making these decisions that are affecting people all over the world. And um, you know, I've used my images of South Louisiana um, for a number of different a number of different spaces, um, but worked with a theater company, two theater companies here in New Orleans, Art Spot Productions and Londo Desaro. And then they blew up my images like 12 feet by five feet or something, and they were used as part of the set as they traveled around the country telling the story of South Louisiana. And in 2017, I was invited to go to The Hague. So this image was taken at the um, so I was invited to go to The Hague uh, because uh, Shell Oil was having their annual general meeting. And so we stood outside with these images of like South Louisiana. Um, you know, and so it was just this really kind of surreal moment where I went into this annual general meeting and it was kind of like sitting with these guys. You know, there were like, I don't know, eight people that were sitting up on the stage like looking down at us. And it was like a moment where I was like, wow, like this is how decisions get made all over the world. Um, and so I think that, you know, in going back to like these guys and the decisions being made and like why images are taken at certain points in time, just to like turn and look at the other wall here and to think about, you know, so many of these images um, were taken around the 18, mid-1860s. Um, this image here, uh, I think 1871, so this is the, before they dredged the Panama Canal. Um, right, so going back to this, like, why were these images taken for what reason? Is it pleasure or is it propaganda? And in most cases, photography was super and still is, you know, incredibly expensive. 
So to see these images and to think about this, I mean, I'm always like, oh, Louisiana Purchase happened in 1803, because that's a really important moment in regards to like my family history, right? Like when the Americans come in, everything changes. Um, and also, I just want to say that I don't know how many of you know this, but um, photography really entered the, this, this America, place we call America from the port of New Orleans. And just want to give credit to Jules Leon, who was a man who brought the daguerreotype from France in 1839, meets this inventor um, who's created this process and brings this work or brings this tool back and is here in New Orleans in 1840, introduces this process. Um, and so in thinking about that, and he was a free man of color, right? So he, in 1840 in New Orleans, was very different than 1865 in New Orleans and how things changed so quickly. And to think about the process and the tools and the technology, how that was changing so quickly too um, during that time. And so, you know, these guys were like going out to photograph the Civil War, you know, post-Civil War, and they have these like wagon carts and crazy, you know, so I think that when I see these images, I have so much appreciation for the process and also for what was captured, but also a lot of questions in regards to like, um, the U.S. was trying to expand into new territories and so, photographing these places where indigenous peoples have been living for centuries and prospecting on what was to come. So again, it's like I look at these images and I wonder what these places look like now. You know, is this, um, I didn't do enough research, but like is this a national park now where indigenous people don't have access and rights to do their rituals? Um, and then just to, to point out here and to think also too, I have a lot of like, you know, um, just questions in regards to how photography is used. So this image was taken in Washington, D.C. It's a Winnebago chief, 1858. I mean, this is a time when people are really petitioning for their land rights. And so here's this man, he's standing in line to talk to the federal government about what's happening here and all of this. Um, and he has his portrait taken and then his portrait becomes almost like a commodity where the photographer is able to like sell that image as like a, a, you know, a tourism thing, right? And so to look at that image also and to also fast forward into the conversations that are being had today in New Orleans where you have black masking Indians, Maroon Indians, we, some of us know them as Mardi Gras Indians, um, who are really questioning how their images of their, who they are and the, the artworks that they're creating are being commodified by photographers who are capturing that moment and then turning it into a piece of work. So I think about that when I when I look at this image a lot. Um, I feel like I'm kind of babbling and I don't really no, know no, what time no. is. I also <laughs> wanted to say that if you guys want to interrupt me or if you have a question, to please do that. Because um, uh, I love conversation. Um, and I can also keep babbling. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think let's move into the other gallery over here. myself notes and then I never look at my notes. <laughs> I'm going to look at my notes for just a minute and make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, yeah. Okay, I said everything. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm sorry, this image is in the corner, but um, I just wanted to kind of, you know, I was speaking about um, access to the tools and um, resources to be able to do the work. And I think this, this room, you know, it makes me think about a lot of things um, in the like, <clears throat> a lot of this imagery has all been, you know, was, was more um, commercially minded and coming out of that, but of course looks completely different when you, when you see it on the walls as opposed to print. But there's this woman, Lola Alvarez Bravo, and um, I'll step away if you guys wanna pass through. This image is really beautiful, and I think about, um, uh, 
being a woman um, and being in this world of, of photography and being someone who's trying to make a living um, as a photographer and also the lineage of, 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 of learning the skills of the trade. And so um, I'm a huge fan of Graciela Intervide, um, who is a, she's still producing work um, based out of Mexico City, an incredible uh, photographer who was a student of Manuel Alvarez Bravo, and his work is in here in this room somewhere too. He's over, over there, I think. The yeah, room. he's over, yeah. yes, yeah, so he's over there. So. Um, and it, again, again, another incredible photographer who I have so much respect for. Um, and so I didn't know about Lola until I, I came here to see the show. And then I like really just found more of her images just online and really fell in love with, with her work and also the time that she's working in. You know, I mean, this image is taken in the 40s, I think. But she starts doing photography in like the 20s and 30s, and to, to, again, like going back to the times, um, the technology and the tools and like what you're using, and also being a woman and being kind of in the shadows of your of your partner, um, but also like your craft um, being developed in that process of supporting and maybe influencing and maybe. Um, doing more of the work sometimes, uh, I would imagine. I don't know, <laughs> but um, but yeah, like these two women, Graciela and and Lola, um, both being kind of out of this lineage. And then there's also this photographer, um, Ruben uh, Ortez Torres, who was a student of Graciela's, who teaches out at a um, University of California in San Diego, and did this incredible work. Um, in the 80s, the punk scene in like Tijuana and Mexico City, and I'm a huge fan of his. So, you know, for me, it's like, it's this, uh, it's really interesting to kind of, to, to see and to feel how, um, and experiencing, um, you know, each other's work and how that becomes fluid. And there's this like kind of osmosis and conversation that that those families of, of, of artists who are coming out of the same place um, exhibit. So, yeah. Um, I guess we'll go into this other room. Makes me scratch my head and be like, okay, 
Um, but these reflections and and just such a minute kind of like reflection of just such a detail in the bigger spectrum of the city and what that says. Um, yeah, and then also again, I feel the same way as like I walk around this room. As I look at this, I want to see this in real life too. Uh, you know, alive on the streets and like what that kind of conversation between images might be like. Um, uh, and I guess I'll just kind of sticking in the, uh, the theme of local artists. You know, this image was really great. The first time I did a walkthrough with Brian of the gallery, um, I had nine young people who were new graduates. Um, so they were 18, eight, nine 18 year olds with me. Um, and you know, this image is uh, constructed from a really famous painting. Um, this image was created though by Tony Campbell and Matt Bees, um in 2010. And I, one, of the, one of the young people was lit, were like, yeah, because this is these these guys are these guys. They're all these guys. They're just like repeating themselves in this space, right? And so they were like, oh, but they're pointing. It's like they're pointing the guns at themselves because they are pointing the guns at themselves because they're the guys, you know. Um, so I think that uh, that where we're at right now in America and that we're essentially pointing guns at ourselves um, and what that says. And how this also makes me think about Katrina um, because it was such a time, and maybe it's because I'm working on this book project right now and so I've been revisiting a lot of that time and how um, you know these moments of, of um, one may call disaster, um, usually there's a learning curve. Sometimes we're not learning as quickly as we should. Um, but that, you know, we were a town under siege in a, in a sense by the water, but then also when you have the military come in and when everything is not making sense um, and, and, and what that means in just regards to gun culture in America. Um, so yeah. I don't want to leave on this dark note, <laughs> but, but this is kind of a dark room. Yes, it's um, hard to avoid that. Yeah, you know. it's, it's really, we could go back and look at these cyanotype. <laughs> um, but I do, I do think about, you know, and a, a lot of all of these images that I look at make me think about Death. I think I'm a person that thinks about thinks about things that are, are have been lost, um, and and not necessarily always in a sad way. But I think that you know the moment is lost. Um, these images are all moments um, that are not stagnant and doesn't look like this anymore. Um, and so again, that like privilege that we have that impression. Um, but I think also. You know, I spend a lot of time, as I was saying in the beginning, um, looking at all of these kind of complex situations and realities that we're facing both socially and environmentally here in this place that is just layered with so much. Um, but that, you know, as I was saying, it's not stagnant. It doesn't have to look this way. And I think also by remembering what it does look like, we can also reimagine what it can look like. So these images that are back here on this wall, you know, were taken to, to remember a really dark time in America that we really haven't gotten that far away from in a lot of ways where you have, you know, this segregation and this oppression. And I think that, you know, a lot of my work, and, and I, would, I would say a lot of photographers and artists are moved to, to tell a story to, with the hope that we're going to move forward in healthy ways. And to think about the darkness and remember that hopefully can help us leap forward. Um, but it's important for us not to forget um, 
and not to erase, just as I was saying in the beginning, you know, that there are there have been people who have lived on these lands for a long time who have called this place by its real name, I think, you know. I think that New Orleans is really boring compared to Bulbuncha. Um, so, you know, I think that by having these windows into worlds and moments that have passed, um, there's a lot to be learned. And, um, and hopefully, yeah, we can capture something different as we move forward. Thank you.